you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, after we came off air last night, as predicted, the final, final obstacle to getting Article 50 cleared, the path open for it to be triggered, happened when the House of Lords backed down, and thank goodness they did. So today, I thought, was going to be the day. Now, we did talk a bit last night about perhaps being blown off course a little bit by Nicola Sturgeon, but does the government not look weak? Doesn't Mrs May look weak? having spent nine months to get us to this point, not to have triggered Article 50 today. Well, the Prime Minister spoke in the House of Commons earlier, and this is a little of what she said. No, no, we haven't got a clip. I'm sorry, I apologise for that. Well, whatever. She spoke to the Commons today, and it was, I have to tell you, somewhat lacklustre. Uh, yeah. She says it's all, it's, it, it's all on course. And we're going to try and get the clip again. Let's listen to the Prime Minister. So we remain on track with the timetable I set out six months ago. And I will return to this House before the end of this month to notify when I have formally triggered Article 50 and begun the process through which the United Kingdom will leave the European Union. This will be a defining moment for our whole country as we begin to forge a new relationship with Europe. Well, that's fine. We've heard it all before, but why don't we just get on with it? I mean, goodness me, we're still paying in a net £30 million every single day. So as soon as we trigger Article 50 and get out of this club, and it's a lot of money, isn't it? Have a look at this building behind me. This is where all your money's going. I mean, there's plenty of it. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I'm in Strasbourg. This is replicated in Brussels. Oh, and I nearly forgot, there's also a European Parliament HQ in Luxembourg as well. So I want us to stop paying all this money. I want us to be free of what I see as this political prison. I think the government looks very weak by saying it's going to be another couple of weeks before we trigger Article 50. But I wonder what you think, and I wonder what Stephen Camden thinks. Steve, good evening. Uh, evening, Nigel, but I think it's actually a cool game she's playing. It's, yeah. Uh, the Rome Treaty, the anniversary, I believe, isn't it, next week or the middle, in between? It's on the 25th of March, that's right, yes. Right. Well, I think either she's going to uh, uh, let them have their moment of glory uh, before she brings in our Brexit. I have, a uh, feeling that, I have a feeling that anniversary is the key to the delay. At the moment. Well, you know, you're absolutely right, Steve. It is 60 years since the Treaty of Rome was signed. And, uh, you know, who could argue against a project of post-World War II, World War I and the Franco-Prussian War, you know, reconciliation? Um, but why would she wait until after that to do it? Is it a matter of respect in your view? Well, I think it could easily be that, but I think it might be that she thinks she'll get better attention after they've had their moment in the limelight. Well, Steve, you say that, but I would say this to you. Uh, the European Parliament is in full session. Tomorrow morning, in that chamber, there will be the Commission President, Mr Juncker. There'll be Donald Tusk from the European Council. There'll be the Prime Minister of Malta. There'll be the Prime Minister of Italy. I mean, tomorrow is a big moment in this place, uh, you know, with over a week to go until the 60th anniversary. And, and, and I think, actually, it wouldn't have been a bad thing to trigger Article 50, to have a big debate tomorrow in this place with all the key players and, Steve, to get this on the agenda for the big European summit of 28 leaders of European countries on the 6th of April. By delaying, it means we can't actually have a serious conversation until the next European summit. And that's going to be maybe in May, but certainly in June. So it could actually be a year after we voted to leave, before we sit round the table and start the negotiation. So, Steve, I take your point. You know, she may be playing a diplomatic game, but equally, do you get why people like me, after nine months, are getting a bit frustrated? Well, I know why you're impatient, Nigel. I think a lot of people are impatient, but um, I just think that the, the hitch in the Lords was what has blown the timetable. It would have been ideal if we could have got it served for the ninth in order to catch this meeting. Uh, yes. this week, but when I heard, it was obvious they weren't going to make that when the Lords messed about um, with their amendments, and they were determined to have their, put their little mark on it. Uh, and I think they all look very silly, actually, because I don't think Nick Clegg has gains in stature from the, um, <laughs> well, what he's been on about. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. And, and, 
And you have to ask yourself, Steve, why are there a hundred life peers in the House of Lords for the Liberal Democrats? I mean, I it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. But, but Steve, I would say this to you. Uh, David Cameron was absolutely explicit in the run-up to the European referendum that if we voted to leave, he was going to trigger Article 50 by the 28th of June. Now, I accept that he stood down the morning after the referendum and there were a couple of turbulent weeks before Theresa May got into office. But frankly, Steve, you know, I have little sympathy for the government's difficulties, whether it's with the High Court, the Supreme Court or the House of Lords. They should, in my opinion, have triggered Article 50 in July of last year, late summer of last year, and we would by now be midway through our negotiations. Yeah, well, when he stood down, he, he put things into uh, Perda for a while, didn't he? It just kind of... Well, it put it, yeah, I mean, you know, it put it back a couple of weeks, Steve, but I, you know, my concern with this is I do actually think that Mrs May and this government look weak. Uh, they look like they haven't got a proper plan. They look like they're dithering. Um, and, and by not triggering Article 50 early, they finished up with a legal challenge. And now all the obstacles are cleared and they're still not getting on with it. I take your point, Steve. She may be playing a game of diplomacy. Either way, uh, I think the, the, there are some big stages coming up, including one here tomorrow, actually, at which this debate should have been had. Steve, I thank you for your call. I wonder what Ramon in Bayswater thinks. Good evening. Hi, Nigel. Um, Hi. I was quite annoyed with your uh, impatience. Like, I, I voted leave as well in this referendum, and I, I'm, I'm on your side here. But do you really yeah. think the civil service is in the position to negotiate something which has never done in the last 60 years? Such a large task. Oh, I wouldn't ask the civil service to do it. I'd get rid of most of them, and I'd sack most of the foreign office as well. I'd start... I'd bring in people who are business people. I would poach people from Switzerland. I'd poach people from South Korea. I'd poach people from Chile. I'd poach people from the countries that have put together the most incredible trade deals over the course of the last few years and have done it, in many cases, in absolute record time. That's how I would have approached it. So you're basically saying that foreigners should be doing it on behalf of us. That's not going to go well, down well with most people who voted leave. Oh, come on. Look, we're not talking about an open door to, to 480 billion, a million people. <laughs> we're talking about a few dozen of professional experts. And by the way, Ramon, they would come on work permits. And once they'd yeah. done their job, they'd have to go. No, I mean, come on. You know, we're talking about if the argument is we haven't yeah. got the expertise. Because for over 40 years, we've given away the ability to make these decisions to bureaucrats in this place, then the obvious thing you do, and if you and I, Rahman, were running a, a company and looking to get involved in a new market, we would recruit yeah. from anywhere in the world to get that expertise. I mean, I'm on, I'm on your side here. As I said, I did vote leave. Um, yeah. On another point, I was just, um, you posted on your social media a picture of you and Marine Le Pen about ah. an hour ago. I was wondering, ah. are, you, are you supporting her in this, uh, in this now, friendship? Now, and Ramon, you support you're... Gert Wilders as well? Because he's quite uh, dangerous, I think. I do not support Gert Wilders in any way at all. Whilst he may be right on the European question, I think the comments that he's made about Islam, in particular, wanting to ban the religion and the Quran and, and, and close down the mosques in the Netherlands, not only is against a sort of great tradition, of religious tolerance. Also, I think, if you go to war against a religion, an entire religion, you are bound to lose. And for that reason, I don't support him. Now, as far as Miss Le Pen's concerned, you're quite right. Anyone that follows my Twitter can see uh, that just an hour and 12 minutes ago, a photograph went up of myself and Marine Le Pen. And I'm not going to answer your question, Raman. And do you know why? Because after the 7.30 News, on this very show, in 20 minutes' time, I will tell you exactly why I was photographed in Paris with Marine Le Pen yesterday. Raman, I thank you for your call, and I'm going to go to Sam in Flintshire. Sam, do you think May and the government look weak by not getting on with the job? Not only do I think they look weak, Nigel, I think that they have missed their window of opportunity um, in terms of triggering it yesterday, as you suggested, because I think... Yeah. Not only would this have had the, um, the advantage of perhaps watering down Nicola Sturgeon's attempts at independence, or at least her proposals for a second yeah. independence referendum, 
I think it actually would have persuaded more voters in the Netherlands to turn out for anti-EU parties. And as much as you've just said that you don't personally agree with uh, Mr. Villers and his views on Islam, yeah, I mean, you have to concede that having a North Sea trading partner outside of the EU would be a positive thing. And this is exactly what he wants to achieve if he can become Prime Minister. So I think oh. not only would it yeah. have been um, good for our domestic issues, it would have been for, good for our issues abroad, and not only our allies outside of Europe, but those that we could find within Europe. Well, you're absolutely right. You know, whatever people think of the politics of Wilders or Le Pen or anybody else, you know, ultimately, you know, these are people who, if they do become prime ministers or presidents of their countries, will adopt a very positive attitude towards trade with the United Kingdom. So, I mean, I agree with that. You know, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, but I, you know, I wonder, I wonder, does the British government really have the courage to do this job properly? I think that they do. Um, I've had my doubts. For a while, I thought that we'd be kept in the single market, which I was very much opposed to. And I'm glad that yeah. Mrs May has announced that. And while I do hold the reservation that perhaps she is trying for a negotiation strategy in which she makes the single market seem like a treat, and by saying that we don't want to be a part of it, actually ends up becoming a part of it um, by making that sound as if it's a reward and making it, yeah. making it um, a concession almost that, that, that we leave. Uh, I don't know whether I've made particular sense on that point, so I apologise on that. That's um, all right. <laughs> don't worry. I have the same trouble every evening. Don't worry. The point is, the point is, we need to have firm resolve. And in a minute, in a minute... I'm going to explain why I think we're getting these negotiations wrong. But right now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show exclusively on LBC, and it's 7.15. This is LBC, live from Strasbourg, The Nigel Farage Show. Call 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. Every obstacle, every barrier is being cleared. We can trigger Article 50 when we like. What on earth was wrong with today? Well, we do know uh, that the SNP did rather blow the Prime Minister off course yesterday. And uh, I have to say that your uh, texts and tweets and Facebook messages from last night are still coming in on that one. Uh, they won't win it, but I agree in the principle of not allowing it. Two referendums in four years is ridiculous. I find it quite amazing uh, that Sturgeon wants to take back control of Scotland only to give it away to Brussels. Well, we had that debate last night. But what I'm saying tonight is I think the government is beginning to look a little bit week to get involved with that call me on 0345 6060 973 text to 84850 tweet at lbc using the hashtag farage at lbc or watch us now on lbc's facebook page live now i'm worried not just about the timing of this there's something else that really is beginning to worry me last week in brussels at the european summit the british negotiators were letting it be known that they were quite happy to put our fishing industry and our territorial waters on the table as a negotiating chip. So just as Edward Heath, all those years ago, in 1972, sold out an entire industry to the European negotiators, it would appear the British government are prepared to do the same thing all over again. Add to that the fact that the Prime Minister and the government appear to want to keep us inside something called the European Arrest Warrant, whereby any British citizen, without the production of any evidence, can be taken off to a Bulgarian jail or a Greek jail. And it happened to a North London boy called Andrew Simeou, uh, left in a hellhole somewhere in Greece, without any evidence ever being presented, and then released a year later without charge. No, they intend to keep that, despite the fact it goes against every fundamental principle of British common law that we've had since, I would say, Magna Carta. And worse still... David Davis, who I guess you'd think is sort of the hard nut of the government when it comes to Brexit, gave a speech in Lithuania three weeks ago in which he said that after we leave, there could be transitional arrangements that might mean that there'd be free movement of people could go on well into the 2020s. So here's my problem. Not only do we look weak by delaying, but we're appearing to want to give concessions even before 
we fired the starting gun and sat round the table. And I don't believe that'll work. I've been in this building, I've been in these institutions now for over 18 years. Yes, I'm even more unpopular now than I was then. But the point is that in negotiations in these institutions, the one thing that never works is weakness. You've got to be strong. And I fear we're going in playing a very weak and a very bad hand. That's my view. Maybe Paul in Cheshire is going to tell me that is completely and utterly wrong. Um, good evening, Mr. Farage. Delight to talk to you. First time good caller. Evening. Um, good evening. Well, um, I, I first time do... caller, far away, Paul. Tell us what you think. Well, I do agree with, with, a, lot of, with a lot of what you've just said there. Um, I, I do want to put you right on a few things, because I know that a few people have called your show previously about this um, myth about if we haven't left the European Union by the 31st yeah. of March, that we're stuck. Um, Article 16, QMB, doesn't apply to our exit. So I think it's really important that we get that point out there, first of all. It only actually... Um, refers to the exit deal, where it goes to the you know the quality majority vote. Um, yeah, so which, which, we... which of course, which of course, the exit deal, of course, does go uh, to. Um, I'm not going to confuse everybody, but a qualified majority vote of all the other 27 member states. But equally, yeah. Paul, one of the points that people aren't hanging, really getting onto, is that this Parliament, the European Parliament does have the ability to veto the whole deal at the end of two years, and that could be the biggest problem that we face. Um, well, it's got to be a majority for that to be the case, but, I mean... The, uh, <laughs> it does, yeah. The, 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 way, the way that I see it is simply, as such as thus, it's going to be a case that we're... It's going to be a punishment negotiation. I, I totally agree with a lot of previous comments on that. I think the likelihood is we're going to have to walk away from the table in order to get a deal if that makes sense to you, because quite frankly, the European Commission are going to be the people leading the negotiations. And as I see it, the supranational policies that they advocate are way more important than the objectives, say, from the European Council or the European Parliament. European Commission are unelected. You know, they can't be kicked yes, out, they can't be replaced. So that's the way that I see it. And I think what's going to happen when the Brexit negotiations do start in six weeks from when we... Uh, invoke Article 50, you're going to see a, a huge conflict of interest and clashes within the European Union themselves, a, a power control, essentially. That's maybe going to work in our advantage, because the European Union going into self-destruct, I think maybe a lot of the Remainers are going to actually see what you and I have probably seen for a very, very long time. I, the reason that I voted to leave um, had nothing to do with immigration. I just know right. what's going to be happening within the European Union from 2020. This is the next phase of the super yeah. state. Yeah, and, 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 and let alone, uh, Paul, uh, the problems in the Eurozone, but the fact that now the diplomatic row with Turkey means that Turkey is going to withdraw the deal that they had to try and hold back the huge migrant tide with the summer coming. I can see that uh, being right back on the agenda, you know, by sort of August, September of this year. No, Paul, they've got huge problems, uh, but I would just say this. You're right about the European Commission being unelected, but this building has elections in May 2019, just a couple of months after we should have left the European Union. And one of the things we should be doing is we should be forming an alliance with uh, European businesses, car manufacturers, wine producers, chocolate makers, call it what you will, whoever it is, <coughs> to put pressure on politicians to say to them, if you do a bad deal, if you do a punishment deal on Britain, the people you're really going to hurt are us, the workers, for whom the United Kingdom is our best export market in the world. Now that, I think, would be quite a clever strategy, wouldn't it? Do you think, though, that the reason that... I mean, I personally disagree with you that there's a delay... Um, the Prime Minister has always said it's going to be the end of March. <laughs> hang on, hang on. It, it, it's been nine months, Paul. It's a nine-month delay. I, 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 get, I, do, I get that fully. I mean, and I, I know that on the 24th of June you wanted to invoke Article 50 yeah. immediately. There has yeah. to be preparation for this because, you know, you have to go out, you have to um, ask businesses what they want from the deal. You, you, there's going to be 18 months of negotiation time only for the two yep. years. Now, if you're invoking yeah. Article 50 on the 24th of June, then you're going to spend a good few months recruiting the civil servants, the solicitors that you need in order to do this process. It's a massive, massive process, as I'm sure that you are fully aware. <laughs> yeah, you but by waiting, 
But by waiting, we gave room for Gina Miller, the House of Lords and everybody else. Paul, I accept that they could have had a few weeks, but I think the fact the government, you know, the Cameron government, the Osborne government, didn't have a plan B, had put nothing in place in terms of, con of, of contingency was, I believe, a dereliction of duty. Paul, you made some great points. To prove our internationalism, we're now going to Norman, who is calling in from Dubai. Norman, good evening. Nigel, good evening. Your last caller has got it absolutely wrong. On referendum day, on Independence Day, the 23rd, it yep. took the great British public less than 14 hours to make a momentous decision. And our government, our government, for heaven's sake, needs to be decisive. It needs to be clear. It needs to be as robust as the British public in making this decision. And yeah. I just don't see it. I see the government um, eventually, you know, the outcome is, you know, despite your, some of your optimism, uh, yeah. Mr. Farage, <laughs> with Mrs. Well. May, and I understand that, and I sometimes share it. But I'm telling you now, and I think you know it in your heart, that it's going to be disappointing and it's going to be a diluted Brexit negotiation. That is what you're going to get from the Conservative Party. No one is holding their, their feet to the fire. UKIP is not represented at all by Mr. Yeah. Carswell or anyone else. Um, yeah. No one is holding, holding them to account. And, and the Labour you know, Party, is, and the Labour Party aren't, are not doing it at all, are they? Absolutely not. And you know, this the, the referendum vote. It wasn't simply a vote about leaving undemocratic, protectionist political structure. It was actually a no confidence vote by most people voting for Brexit in our political establishment, in yeah. our established political parties. We, we no longer have confidence in them, and this is. It's coming out. The fruition of all of this is now coming out in the behaviour of the government. I mean, just uh, three months ago, we had Dr. Liam Fox here in Dubai speaking to the British business community, ostensibly yeah. as one of the lever, lever uh, members of the, the British cabinet. Yeah. But all he had was excuse after excuse. I mean, I, I asked him about why is it taking, why wasn't Article 50 implemented on the day that Theresa May was elected Conservative leader. And he said, As you we know, were... he came up with lots of reasons. He said, we, we don't have negotiators. We don't have negotiators. We, we didn't need to have negotiators in the last 35 years, 40 years of being in the EU. It takes us time to recruit them. And I said, well, you know, I'm a business person. If I needed to recruit someone tomorrow, I've got about 10 recruitment agencies where I can yeah. bring in these candidates yeah. within, within a day. Yeah, it wouldn't be hard, would it? It really, really, Norman, it would not be hard, not be on the wood of man. Uh, you and I are absolutely at one with that. Uh, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show exclusively here on LBC. It's 7.30, time for the news. This is LBC, live from Strasbourg, The Nigel Farage Show. Call 0345 6060 973, text 84850. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. Well, we had dramatic elections last year. We had Brexit, we had Trump, we had the Italians rejecting uh, the government in a referendum and the Prime Minister going. We've got Dutch elections happening tomorrow. But I think the French presidential election is as big an event as any of those. Now, there are three front runners. One of them, Francois Fillon, who for six years was the French Prime Minister, a Conservative. Uh, you know, he was favoured. He was the number one choice uh, of many, or seemed to be. He's in some trouble. Uh, he's now been placed under formal investigation because of the money that he paid to his wife and his children for allegedly not doing the job, though taking public money. The second big front runner is Emmanuel Macron, 39 years old, good looking, centre left, a big supporter of the European Union, big believer in the Euro, big supporter of a European army, uh, and, and he is absolutely up there in the opinion polls. And I was amazed when a couple of weeks ago, uh, Theresa May invited him to number 10 Downing Street for a meeting and allowed him to do a press conference on the steps of Downing Street. I thought, why is a Conservative Prime Minister supporting a left-of-centre candidate? And yet, she refused to meet Marine Le Pen. Now, bear in mind, there were 300,000 French voters living and working in London. 
Uh, and yet they've been given, in a sense, a PR puff for Emmanuel Macron. So I thought perhaps I'd try and do something about that, try and help to redress that balance. So the answer is the photograph that you've seen on Twitter with Marine Le Pen and myself was me in her head office in Paris yesterday afternoon. And I uh, decided I wasn't going to support her. I wasn't going to oppose her. I was going to interview her exclusively for LBC. Here's just a little taste of what she said. And what does, I mean, Britain leaving the European Union, what does it mean for the European Union? What does it mean for France and, the, and, and in particular for this election? Well, obviously, it's a very strong signal. It shows that there is at least one way of finding the keys of the jail, because we have been told that it was impossible to leave the EU, and the UK has just demonstrated that when people want it, well, you can set up the conditions to exit the EU. So thank you for showing us the way out from this huge prison, which is the EU, for the peoples. It is very lucky for the UK. And everybody knows that um, because beyond the strategy of fear implemented before Brexit, uh, Great Britain is already reaping all the benefits of this bold decision that the people made. It makes it possible to be free and to move forward without uh, the EU poking a knife in your ribs and obliging you to go somewhere you may not want to go. It makes you able to control your borders, your economy. You can negotiate trade agreements in the interest of your country. If you want to see that clip, go to lbc.co.uk. It's there available. And the full interview with Marine Le Pen, conducted by me exclusively for LBC, will be aired at 7pm until 8pm tomorrow evening, followed by, I suspect, many, many hours of phone calls that will go on until the early hours of the morning. So to hear, to hear the Le Pen exclusive interview, 7pm tomorrow evening, only on LBC. But back to our question tonight. Does Theresa May look weak in not triggering Article 50? Are we making a bit of a mess of our negotiations by making too many concessions too early? And are we really listening to the SDP when we simply don't need to? Um, that question I'm going to ask to our next caller, who is Andy. Andy in Cardiff. Andy, good evening. Good evening. So what I do you think, think Andy? That, I think that it's uh, a bit of both. I don't think it's a mistake, but I don't think it's good either. I think the fact, I mean, you know by now, I've called in a few times, <clears throat> that uh, Theresa May, I can be very critical of with every move she makes, and putting the fisheries policy on the table or the possibility yep. of it um, is a huge mistake. However, um, if it's an opening stance in a negotiating uh, bid, I can see it becoming um, a fishing by license kind of end game um, for the EU in our waters. But on the flip side of that, I can also see um, you, Nigel, having a huge grin on your face tomorrow, the day after, and in the coming week. I think that this is a play by Theresa May after a conversation in the summit with Tuscan Juncker that's yeah. going to result in Tuscan Juncker standing in front of the parliament tomorrow in the EU and actually dampening down their hardline approach to all the EU nations that are sitting there in front of them. And I think this is the purpose of having that well. meeting at the summit. I, Andy, Andy, I get that. I get that. And, and where I'm going to agree with you is this. What I, and and if, if you look at tomorrow's Daily Telegraph, you might just see an article written by someone su suggesting these ideas. But what I'm now picking up is that there's almost an alliance now building of businesses across the EU, uh, be they banks or, or chocolate manufacturers or whatever they are. Uh, and they are beginning to say, to their own leaders, their own local politicians, uh, the bosses uh, like Juncker, whenever they can access them, they're beginning to say, do you know what? No deal hurts us a lot more than it hurts the United Kingdom. So I actually think, Andy, that despite the bluster of the Verhofstadt's and people like that, I actually think we're now in actually a quite good position. And I think when you're in a good, strong position, you don't start to make concessions in the corridors you know, until you've actually formally sat down around the table. So, Andy, I'm with you. I think there is a softening in tone here. I think that's good news. 
I think it's led by European business, but I don't think we've got our tactics right in terms of making concessions before we even start. I agree with you uh, 100%. I think, like I say, it's a huge mistake, even though the end game could be different. What I will say is I've seen you many times speaking in the EU Parliament and, you know, putting the, effectively putting the willies up them. And uh, <laughs> what, what I have also noticed is you have an awful lot of sheep in there that will actually bow to the feet of Juncker and the Hofstad and Tusk. Oh, yeah. And they do whatever yeah. they say without question, even if their own country yeah. are saying, please do this for us. Andy, they will look Andy, Tusk and Juncker. Andy, these people get a good salary, right? They get invited to a never-ending round of lunches, dinners, champagne receptions, breakfasts, games of golf, you name it. And you know what? When you finish in this parliament for the day, and by the way, can you see behind me, everyone's gone home now. Um, But when you leave the building as an MEP, there's a massive fleet of chauffeur-driven cars downstairs who'll take you to your restaurant, to your hotel or whatever. The point is, Andy, most people in this institution have got a lifestyle way better than they could ever expect in the private sector back in their member states. They like it. They are, you know, even those that come here, a bit Eurosceptic, tend to get bought off by the lifestyle. Well, I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to being first in the queue outside the EU Parliament with his camera to actually watch the four lease sign go up on that building. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, when you are, come and see me, Andy, and we'll have a drink. And I thank you for your call. And I wonder what Luke in Colchester thinks. Luke, good evening. No, we've lost him, but we're going to go to Tom in Didcot, who is still there, I think. Tom, good evening. I am indeed. Hello. Good evening, um, Mr. Farage. Um, I'd like to ask... Uh, about this, um, what necessarily it is that makes Theresa May weak when she's just won such a um, massive vote within the Commons? I mean, only one MP has has gone against the party whip. I mean, I personally think it'd be a far better approach to um, deliberate with Cabinet and formulate a plan before releasing that to the press and making herself the sort of, you know, uh, UK president to put her in the best position to negotiate a good trade deal. Well, Tom, she's been the Prime Minister since last July. <laughs> it's, that is, it is that nine. Is the truth, of Come course, on, Tom. Yeah, with the Tom. legal challenges that we've faced. I mean. Well, well that's yeah. because we dithered, Tom. If we hadn't dithered, there wouldn't have been any legal challenges, would there? <laughs> that is true, but I, I still think. <laughs> I think I'd rather the legal challenges were now and uh, sooner and before we attempted to trigger it rather than embarrassing us on the world stage. I mean, if we'd got halfway through the talks and we have the judiciary up in arms about how we've triggered it with the royal prerogative against the... Aye, Tom, it would, it, it would have been too late, mate, but then it would have been, you know, a done deal, wouldn't it? We'd, we, we'd have been on the route. Look, I, I... Tom, let me say this. I think she gives incredible speeches. You know, she stands up, she gives very strong speeches uh, until today in the Commons, which wasn't so much, but she's given some very strong performances on this. She's given amazing reassurance. David Davis has done exactly the same thing. He was very good on the television this weekend. It all sounds wonderful, and then you look at what they're doing. It's dithering, it's shilly-shallying, and it's making these concessions that I talked about just ten minutes ago. Uh, And I just think it gives the impression of being a little bit weak, Tom. What do you think? Well, I think those concessions are exactly what we need to, to go into to negotiations with. I mean, they seem like we're shooting ourselves in the foot now. But I yeah. mean, if you've got... Um, well, okay, I'm mainly, I'm mainly thinking from the perspective of France. So if Le Pen and such win and we have this sort of surge of uh, anti-EU yeah. sentiment throughout the country, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I think if we come and approach that's not necessarily completely 100% well, Eurosceptic, but... Tom, um, you, the, Tom, Tom, you're being too British... You're being too decent. You're wanting to play by the Queensbury rules. No one here does that. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show exclusively here on LBC. It's 7.45. The Nigel Farage Show, live from Strasbourg, only on LBC. I just don't think the government recognises what a strong position we're in. Do you know that the other European countries, do you know what they call the United Kingdom? They call it Treasure Island. And the reason is we buy more cars and more wine and more chocolate than any other country in the world. So we're actually in a great position. And I'm worried all this dithering, all the concessions we appear to be making. Actually, we can do rather better than that. Now, Luke in Colchester ran away last time, but I believe you're back, Luke. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Nigel. OK, I got cut off. Uh, That's well, all right. Let me thank you for being a hero to the silent majority. 
Uh, well, me and my Hungarian kind. wife think you're amazing. So thank you very much for that. You're very uh, kind, Luke. Now, what about the government? Should they crack on with this and recognise what a strong position we're in? OK, well, um, Theresa May's got to be quite careful, I think, right now, because um, okay. it, it's important to be tactical at this point, because we have to remember she's facing a fight on quite a few fronts. I mean, we've got the bullies in Brussels. We've got the yeah. belligerence of the SNP. We've yeah. got the vocal minority. And then, of course, we've got conviction politicians who are kind of creeping up out of the woodwork here, there and everywhere and are pretty much doing whatever they can to undermine her. So I think she needs to be quite careful and pick her battles carefully with this one. Well, uh, OK, Luke, maybe I'm too gung-ho. Perhaps I am. But I think uh, when you're in a position as strong as she is, you know, she's got a 19-point lead in the opinion polls. She's pretty much unassailable in Parliament. Uh, you know, she's in a very good position. And the argument I'm making, Luke, is from all my experience here, all the European summits I've watched, all the negotiations I've watched, these people only respect strength. And I think the British generally think we can be all very charming and very nice. And we wonder why we lose every time. Mm, but I think that I think the truth of the matter is I think she needs to be careful not to squander any kind of tactical um, debating or kind of discussion, any sort of advantage she's got here. She needs to be quite careful okay. and really pick her fights, I think. So, uh, all right. yeah, no, whilst well, so I, I agree I, with you to a point. Yeah. No, I take your point, Luke. You're saying that she needs to exercise a little bit of caution um, and to play the game clever. Fight, Luke, thank you for your call. Now, I just made the point about how different politics in Europe is compared to the United Kingdom. Let me tell you something. Commercial radio is very, very different across the rest of Europe. And earlier on today, just before coming on air with you, um, I did an interview with a programme called La Zanzara, it's broadcast by Radio 24. They're an Italian daily programme. It's presented by two Italian journalists, Giuseppe and David. Just have a listen to what Italian talk radio is like. You are destroying Europe. No, you are well, destroying I'm, Europe. Well, I've made a start. I've knocked a couple of bricks out the bottom of the wall. Uh, but don't worry, the rest will come tumbling down. No, 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 I understand. I understand. Repeat, please, because uh, his English is like Renzi's okay. English. So. Okay. so what I'm saying is, I've managed to knock out the bottom two bricks in the wall marked European Union. They've gone, and I'm hoping the rest of it will just come tumbling down. <laughs> Dai, traduci, vai, traduci. Conte, qualcuno che Conte, traduce. Conte, la Manuela Conte. Dai. Ha dato? Dai, vai, vai. Why you are here not in London now? You don't, you don't stay here, because this is not your house, this, this part. Oh, no, there's real fun to be had here. Oh, just you wait. This is going to be the most amazing <laughs> pantomime performance over the next two years. Because you know something? At the end of the two-year negotiation, this parliament could veto the whole Brexit deal. So I've got to be here to keep them on their toes. Well, there you are. That is, that is talk radio, Italian style, with two presenters shouting uncontrollably at the guest at the same time. It's lively, it's fun, it's certainly different. I don't think, having listened to that, uh, that Global Radio will decide that's quite the route for LBC. Uh, but I enjoyed it, and I hope that you enjoyed the clip too. And I'm going to ask Freddie in Cambridge. Freddie, is this government too weak? Are we conceding too much, or... Is it cleverer to play the subtle, long game, as several callers suggest? No, they are far too weak. They should have implemented Article 50 straight away and just gone yep. steaming ahead with it. We have been betrayed. We've been betrayed over, you know, the result of the referendum not being taken enough notice. OK, they may not be legally binding referendum, but it's absolutely stupid in this instance to argue that people have been deprived of their representation when... You know, the MP said, oh, we've got to represent our electorate. Every single one in their electorate had a, a chance for a vote. So that's a nonsensical reason. I mean, I are you, I mean, mean Freddie, are you, are you worried that at the end of this two years, we're simply not going to have got the things that you expected when you voted in I, that referendum last I, year? I think, I think there's a serious risk that we won't. I mean, now, we, they start talking now. Uh, they, didn't talk, they didn't ask us about this, but they start talking now about shared sovereignty. What's a stupid? How can you have shared sovereignty? No, I think, quite honestly, we are strapped to a rotting court. And they don't want to let us go for fear that they will sink. Oh, hang on, Freddie. Who's, 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 who's the rotten corpse? Is it Brussels or Westminster? No, it's the European Union. 
the whole European right. Union. Westminster, Westminster is just a, you know, a, a boil on, on a carbuncle. What we need <laughs> is to come back. Oliver Cromwell, you <laughs> are needed. Now, you know, I, that's what I, I think. We should take Parliament on now. I've had enough of it. They right, think they're no. so special. No, I, don't, I, I don't think you're alone in that, and, and certainly with the House of Lords, uh, there's a lot of people, Freddie, feeling like you, and I sense uh, that if Brexit doesn't mean Brexit in 2019, Freddie, you will be leading a march, I suspect, from Cambridge on, on Westminster. Would that sound about right? Leading it. Your, 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 uh, your destiny is not yet fulfilled, Nigel. You've only done part of it. So you've got to sit around <laughs> and make sure that if we, if we don't get what we want on this Brexit, then I think we start a national campaign at the grassroots and we yep. call for a constitutional change. And meanwhile, while we're calling for it, we can sit around and, you know, talk sensibly about what, what we want to put right and how we would do it. Freddie, I'll make you a promise now, live on air, but when it comes to Brexit, if this is unfulfilled, I am going nowhere. And if I have to, uh, don khaki again, as it were, and get back in the front lines, Freddie, I will be there. And no doubt you will be by my side. Thank you. Um, I wonder what Harrison and Loughborough thinks. Harrison, should she play the clever, subtle, longer game, or just as I think, get on with it? Hi, Nigel. Well, in the perfect world, you'd be Prime Minister, your Deputy Prime Minister. Um, but uh, I feel as though we have been playing the standoffish game, like you've said. And I think it has been clever. We've been able to assess our, our uh, goals, what, what's to come next in terms of commerce, yep. Yep. especially with, the, with the, uh, the Commonwealth, the US, and potentially China, free trade agreements that could occur there. Um, and at the same time, I also just want to get it over and done with and trigger the article. Yeah, I, I, I mean, everyone's talking about downside and risk, or at least some people are. And I don't know whether you saw the figures yesterday, but our export figures for the last quarter of last year showed the highest growth for 10 years. So there's some really exciting, great things going on out there, and in particular, going on with British business outside the European Union. One of the Brexit bonuses is that the pound which had been falling for the last couple of years anyway, that the pound fell a bit further, and it's making UK exports really competitive. And Harrison, the reason, and I think you, know, you and I are pretty much at one with this, but the reason yeah. that, I am, that I am so excited about this, and I want to get it done, is there's a whole new world out there, uh, including the Commonwealth countries, friends of ours, fast emerging economies, and, and I just think this is our chance to go global, to get back our self-confidence, and to be a great country again. Yeah, absolutely. There's a demand for British uh, services and goods. And I'm just, I'm excited just like you to see um, what's going to happen next, really. Yeah, well, Harrison, I think the future is terribly exciting. I thank you for your call. I thank everybody uh, that's called in uh, this evening. Uh, two very clear opinions. Some think playing the long game, being subtle, uh, giving a few concessions is what will work. Uh, I take the view uh, that these people only ever respect strength and that actually we're in a very very good position. So tomorrow, between 7 and 8 o'clock, it is my exclusive interview with Marine Le Pen. She's currently in the lead in the opinion polls for the first round of the French presidential election. There are 30 to 14 candidates. Two of them will go for a head-to-head. -head. It'll all be decided in May. Uh, tomorrow's interview, I think you'll find interesting, exciting. You'll get a real perspective on who Marine Le Pen is. You've been listening to the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. Coming up at 10, it's Ian Collins, but up next, it's Ian Payne. Thank you very much indeed, Nigel. I should certainly look forward to that tomorrow between 7 and 8. I'll be back at 8 tonight, though, for this hour. Prime Minister. So we remain on track with the timetable I set out six months ago. And I will return to this House before the end of this month to notify when I have formally triggered Article 50 and begun the process through which the United Kingdom will leave the European Union. This will be a defining moment for our whole country as we begin to forge a new relationship with Europe. Well, that's fine. We've heard it all before, but why don't we just get on with it? I mean, goodness me, we're still paying in a net £30 million every single day. So as soon as we trigger Article 50 and get out of this club and... It's a lot of money, isn't it? Have a look at this building behind me. This is where all your money's going. 
I mean, there's plenty of it. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I'm in Strasbourg. This is replicated in Brussels. Oh, and I nearly forgot. There's also a European Parliament HQ in Luxembourg as well. So I want us to stop paying all this money. I want us to be free of what I see as this political prison. I think the government looks very weak by saying it's going to be another couple of weeks before we trigger Article 50. But I wonder what you think, and I wonder what Stephen Camden thinks. Steve, good evening. Uh, evening, Nigel, but I think it's actually a cool game she's playing. It's, yeah. Uh, the Rome Treaty, the anniversary, I believe, isn't it, next week or the middle, in between? It's on the 25th of March, that's right, yes. Right. Well, I think either she's going to... Uh, uh, let them have their moment of glory uh, before she brings in our Brexit. I have a uh, feeling that I have a feeling that anniversary is the key to the delay at the moment. Well, you know, you're absolutely right, Steve. It is 60 years since the Treaty of Rome was signed, and uh, you know, who could argue against? a project of post-World War II, World War I and the Franco-Prussian War, you know, reconciliation. Um, but why would she wait until after that to do it? Is it a matter of respect in your view? Well, I think it could easily be that, but I think it might be that she thinks she'll get better attention after they've had their moment in the limelight. Well, Steve, you say that, but I would say this to you. Uh, the European Parliament is in full session. Tomorrow morning... It ...has blown the timetable. It would have been ideal if we could have got it served for the 9th in order to catch this meeting uh, yes. this, we, this week. But when I heard, it was obvious they weren't going to make that when the Lords messed about um, with their amendments. And they were determined to have their, put their little mark on it. Uh, and I think they all look very silly, actually, because I don't think Nick Clegg has gains in stature from the, um, <laughs> well, what he's been on about. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. And, and, and you have to ask yourself, Steve, why are there a hundred life peers in the House of Lords for the Liberal Democrats? I mean, I it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's extraordinary. Scale. It's extraordinary. But, but, Steve, I would say this to you. Uh, David Cameron was absolutely explicit in the run-up to the European referendum, that if we voted to leave, he was going to trigger Article 50 by the 28th of June. Now, I accept that he stood down the morning after the referendum, and there were a couple of turbulent weeks before Theresa May got into office. But frankly, Steve, you know, in that chamber, there will be the Commission President, Mr Juncker, there'll be Donald Tusk, from the European Council. They'll be the Prime Minister of Malta. They'll be the Prime Minister of Italy. I mean, tomorrow is a big moment in this place, uh, you know, with over a week to go until the 60th anniversary. And, and, and I think, actually, it wouldn't have been a bad thing to trigger Article 50, to have a big debate tomorrow in this place with all the key players and, Steve, to get this on the agenda for the big European summit of 28 leaders of European countries on the 6th of April. By delaying, it means we can't actually have a serious conversation until the next European summit. And that's going to be maybe in May, but certainly in June. So it could actually be a year after we voted to leave before we sit round the table and start the negotiation. So, Steve, I take your point. You know, she may be playing a diplomatic game, but equally, do you get why people like me after nine months, are getting a bit frustrated. Well, I know why you're impatient, Nigel. I think a lot of people are impatient, but um, I just think that the, the hitch in the Lords was what... Rush. Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, after we came off air last night, as predicted, the final, final obstacle to getting Article 50 cleared the path open for it to be triggered, happened when the House of Lords backed down. And thank goodness they did. So today, I thought, was going to be the day. Now, we did talk a bit last night about perhaps being blown off course a little bit by Nicola Sturgeon. But does the government not look weak? Doesn't Mrs May look weak, having spent nine months to get us to this point, not to have triggered Article 50 today? Well, the Prime Minister spoke in the House of Commons earlier, and this is a little of what she said. No, no, we haven't got a clip. I'm sorry, I apologise for that. Well, whatever. She spoke to the Commons today, and it was, I have to tell you, somewhat lacklustre. Uh, yeah, 
She says it's all it's it, it's all on course, and we're going to try and get the clip again. Let's listen to the.